Hi everybody, welcome to the State Library today and I'm really excited to be here today to facilitate this forum, you can ask that. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands on which we're meeting today, the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge the critical role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have in contributing to creating inclusive environments in our communities. Before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. The doors are obviously to exit at the back and the bathrooms are just past the brick cafe outside, including access bathrooms. Also, I'd like to introduce and thank our excellent Auslan interpreter, Julie, and acknowledge the really important role that she's playing and someone else will join as well, Melinda, in our discussion today. So today's forum is really designed to be a safe and supportive environment where we can discuss issues related to inclusive design. For you as the audience to ask questions of and share ideas with the panel. And the panel have um, expertise not only in lived experience with disability, but also in advocating for positive change in our communities with respect to access and inclusion. We hope that the answers that we give today as a panel bring a fresh perspective for you in the terms of the way that you think about design and also inspire you to put accessibility at the beginning and at the centre of all of your design processes. After the forum, there'll be a chance for you to mingle with each other and with us as the panel outside for afternoon tea. But before we introduce our amazing panel, I'd like to just give you a little bit of insight about me and why I'm here today. So I was born in Brisbane and I've spent most of my life living here and my adult life mostly in West End, so I'm a local. As a young adult studying psychology at the University of Queensland, I used to view myself and my disability as the problem when I wasn't able to access the spaces and the events that I wanted to in my community. As I grew older and hopefully a little bit wiser, I realised that really the problem lies in that infrastructure is not being built with my experience and needs and the experience and needs of other people with disability like on the panel today in mind. So I was motivated to contribute to positive change in this space. So a few years ago with my friend, I founded a consulting business called Consultable. And we are dedicated to strengthening inclusion and access in our businesses, in our communities. When we work with clients, it's really pleasing to see that so many businesses are motivated to do the hard work to make change in this space, to ensure that their event or their building or their um, venue is more accessible for people with disability. And the main motivating factor for me to continue this work, despite having another full-time job, is that I love seeing, when I work with clients, the way that their perception shifts when you show them that sometimes it's little changes that can make a huge difference in how accessible and inclusive an event or a, um, a building is. And so that's what really motivates me to keep going. And that's why I think the topic of today's discussion is so important for us all to come together and learn about the different ways that we can make our communities more inclusive and more accessible. So that's enough about me. I'll leave it now to the panel to introduce themselves and I'll start with Brendan. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Brendan Donoghue. I am a local uh, West End um, advocate for uh, access and inclusion. I uh, mainly deal with content um, accessibility and also making sure that um, um, all things like um, transport and local facilities are accessible to um, uh, people who are blind or have low vision and uh, I uh, have lived experience of that and I'm really looking forward to sharing my uh, views and opinions today on this panel. Oh, hi, I'm Lorraine Mulready. I'm a retired occupational therapist. So I worked for uh, 40 years in all different sorts of areas of um, health care and rehabilitation in hospitals, community settings, rehabilitation settings, it's across a wide range of um, um, specialist areas. 
And then, and also, I have uh, I have MS, and have been using a wheelchair um, uh, to varying degrees for 12 to 15 years. So I have that lived experience as well. And I'm really happy to be here and to see so many people interested in how you can contribute to making things better for us. Thank you. Hello, I am Catherine Lyons. I'm a global advocate for inclusion, sanitation, and hygiene. I founded a business called Accessibility back in 2016 around sanitation hygiene and worked on with the government and um, different variants of sectors of architects and designers in creating accessible spaces for people with disabilities around sanitation and also around the community access for people with disabilities. And that took me on the global stage, becoming a public speaker and so forth, and helping to make changes around the world. So, thank you. Really? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. A little bit about myself, but before I start, I've got to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on, the, the Yagra and Turbal, who occupy this area, and thank them for being on, us for being on this land. Uh, my name is Wilfred Prince, though I'm simply known throughout the community and elsewhere as Uncle Willie. Identify as a First Nations person first and a person with a disability second. I acknowledge my Aboriginality first, more so than I acknowledge my disability. I was born in Cherbourg on Waka Waka country and I also have a spiritual connection and acknowledge my Kalkadoon heritage from Mount Isa in Queensland. Um, a, little bit about, a little bit more about me, um, I was born before the 1967 referendum, which meant that when I was born, I was born a no one, nobody. I wasn't even a citizen of this country when I was born. Up until the 1967 referendum, things changed for the better for me because that's, um, even though I, I had a, a acquired disability back then, um, um, I was removed from, from, my, from my culture, my family, and I grew up in an institution. I grew up, I was there for a very, very long time. And it was through there that I started to think about myself and where I was from and about more about my disability. So uh, my disability, I wanted to know more about that and how I could help my own mob um, gain a voice for themselves. And, and along my journey, I started advocating for the rights of my mob and other people in general about access to and from. Simple things like um, accessing up through a, bar, through a doorway. Some door, when you look at it, um, uh, for example, the do, some doorways are very narrow um, and they're not always compliant. And so you advocate to make that doorway a little bit wider so you could, you could go through there in your wheelchair. Um, yeah, so I can tell you a bit more about that later on. Thank you. Well, thanks, Uncle Willie. My name's Carney Liddell, and I also want to pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room today, and especially to my brothers and sisters from the Indigenous communities who have a disability, because over half of their community identify as having a disability. Um, it's always hard for me to describe myself. I find this, you know, the elevator pitch, the lift pitch, is uh, not easy, and it's often the case because when you have a disability, you probably just heard then, we all have more than one occupation or one job or one degree. And there's a reason for that, I believe, is because we keep on getting degrees and keep on having to have more than one job because most of us are unable to get a job because right now Australia is one of the worst countries in the Western world when it comes to employment of people with a disability. In fact, as a very proud Paralympian, we won, Australia beat the whole world at the Sydney 2000 Paralympic Games. I was a part of that team. I had nothing to do with it, of course. Um, they haven't won since, but again, 
nothing to do with me. And I remember being there at that 2000 Paralympics and representing Australia as a young 21-year-old girl from Rockhampton. Don't hold that against me. I was Miss Beef Week, Beth, in 1996. Uh, and went to my first Paralympics in Atlanta in 1996. Great year, 1996. Miss Beef Week and my first Paralympic Games. But in the year 2000, I remember vividly, Australia showed up for us. They loved us. We actually had more people come to the Paralympic Games, the Olympic Games. So we had 2,000 more people come through those gates at the 2000 Paralympics. And then when we came home from doing the most physical thing you can ever do in your life, which is, of course, be a Paralympian, I couldn't get a job. And I found that really mind-boggling, because I was thinking, well, hang on a minute, you expect us to play wheelchair rugby. You've seen that, right? They call it murderable. You expect me to be the best swimmer in the world and I've got a muscle-wasting disease and I can't lift my arms above my head. But then I came back to Australia and I couldn't be a bank teller. I couldn't be a journalist. And even today, I've done a journalism degree, a media degree, a communications degree, a speech pathology degree, and a master's of social work. Because every time I did a degree, I thought, oh, this will do it. But if you think about it, have you ever seen a journalist, really a lot of journalists or people on our mainstream TVs, looking obviously physically disabled or obviously disabled. I love how we have to say, now we have to say, what is it? What do we call ourselves now? A lived experience? I mean, oh my goodness. <sighs> I'm a disabled person and I'm a very proud disabled person. And I would love to see people with disabilities doing everyday jobs. So when you become a social worker, I should be able to be a social worker. If I want to be a journalist on TV, I shouldn't have to talk about disability. And I'm up here not because I want to change Brisbane tomorrow with a magic wand and make the whole place accessible, which would be great, because currently I can probably only access about 10% of it. It's because the easiest thing we can change today or tomorrow is our attitudes about disability. Because the, the hardest thing for me about having a disability is this misconception that I'm the riskiest person in this room. Well, not now. <laughs> not with these guys next to me. Woohoo! And girls. I'm the riskiest person in this room to support, employ, or serve. And that's a misconception that is not true, fair, or legitimate. So that's why I'm here today. I'm also a mum to a six-year-old boy. Thanks, Carney. And I think a lot of the things you picked up on there you know, there's a lot of barriers for, barriers for us to access work and employment, and some of those are because of physical spaces. So some of the discussion today will hopefully, over time, have a positive impact on our ability to get the jobs that we want and that we deserve. So thanks, everyone, from the panel to intro for introducing themselves. So to facilitate the asking of questions today, we're using Slido, and my friends will attest to the fact that I'm not very technology savvy, and even I can use it, so it's really quite straightforward. So if you have a smart device on you, you scan the barcode, you don't need to um, have a login, and you just can post a question. You can post it anonymously, or you can post it with your name. You can post a, a question to a specific member of the panel, if you wish, or you can just post a question, and I'll make the decision about who is best placed to answer that. So um, I really encourage you to post the questions that you're interested in hearing an answer to. And if you see a question on there that you didn't ask, but someone else did, feel free to like it. And if you like it, it'll get bumped up to the top of the list. If anyone doesn't have a smart device or there's access requirements, which mean you can't use the app, either talk to the person next to you, and I'm sure they'll be happy to help out, or ask one of the staff around, who I know will also pop a question on there for you. OK, I see there's already some questions on the board. So let's have a think. So what is something that architects and designers could do that, oh, that would make you feel welcomed, more welcomed in a space? Catherine, did you want to talk to that one? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, something that you could do to make us feel more welcomed is when you're actually designing these spaces, 
bring people with lived experiences in to actually help you create the spaces. And not just like people in wheelchairs or, or one variant of type, bring us, bring like a multitude and of pe different people because everyone's gonna have their own input to put in. But the thing you need to look at is a holistic approach, not something that's just gonna work for one person. It needs to work for more so the majority than the m minority. So when you're thinking about anything with design around disability, Bring, bring someone in to help you with that step and then work a way through around it because that's going to make us feel a lot more welcomed in the place that you're wanting to create and build. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think also for places that are already existing, I'm not sure what the panel's opinions are, this, are on this, but for me what makes me feel really welcomed is when as soon as I get somewhere, I can see how I can access the building. Whereas often our experience of being in a wheelchair is that we have to search for the accessible entrance. And I find that A, difficult, because I have a bad sense of direction and will turn myself around and get lost. But also it doesn't make me feel like the building is welcoming me in. So that's something as well that I think is really important for those buildings and spaces that are already existing. Most definitely. Having a sign up to say where a ramp is or, or an entrance of some sort is for us to be able to enter the building would be a great start, but also making it that the visually impaired can actually um, understand the sign as well would be a great thing as well, because otherwise, how are we going to be able to access the building? Then if it's, say, a restaurant, um, making the spaces a little bit more wider so we can actually access without having to bump into people and things like that um, is another way to go as well. and just or having someone to help assist go to the place um, and just make it a little bit more open and it'll be a lovely, friendly environment. Brendan, a specific question for you. What would make Brisbane buses more accessible to blind and low vision people? Uh, Brisbane buses are the vein of my um, existence at the moment. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is they do not actually have um, audio announcements in them. So um, as you're travelling from stop to stop and when you are looking at the, um, for the next stops, um, the biggest challenge uh, for me is that I'm actually not even able to know um, where my stop is or where I am. So one of the biggest changes that would be really helpful is for more audio announcements to be considered and also for um, a lot of the excuses around it's all so expensive um, and actually start uh, bringing people in uh, with uh, blind and uh, vision impairment uh, to actually uh, look at how we can uh, fix this uh, major um, issue on our transport network. Yeah, and you'd think that that would be something that, you know, obviously, Brendan, you taught there about the expense, that that's the excuse that people use. But we know that on, on other forms of public transport, there are um, auditory announcements about where you are. So I think that's a good example of something that is actually really tangible. Often people think that to make something more accessible, it's a whole myriad of things that aren't really doable. But that's something that's really tangible. We know that it works in other environments. So surely they can find the funding and work with you to get it done. You would think so, and there's myriads of transport, and actually um, Canberra in the um, Canberra um, uh, is uh, one of the uh, territories here that actually um, has actually implemented audio announcements on buses for several years now, and there's a lot more of um, uh, blind people that actually can move around in their community in Canberra. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Brendan. Um, there's a question here. Does the council provide accessibility training to businesses or accreditation incentives to be accessible? Kani, I know we were talking before a bit about training um, and that you wear many different hats in the community. So I'm wondering if you've got any insights on this one. Yeah, there's plenty of places around that do... I know that um, there's quite a few access consultants. We were having a bit of a joke about that before, weren't we, Brendan, about... Yeah, I don't want to do that course just on principle, <laughs> but I'd love to be in the class just to annoy them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always say I've got a master's in disability from just obviously having a disability for 44 years. Um, there are lots of different courses. Um, I know that... Is it AFDO, Australian Federal DO? No, what's what I'm thinking of? There's so many. And 
Australian Network on Disabilities, they'd have like a gold, silver, bronze course you can do. Dylan Orcott's obviously got that huge, big recruitable business, which has Get Skilled Access. There's a whole bunch of places you can go. I do it. We all probably do it um, as consultants. It depends on what you want to do, but I think really it's really important to, to get the word out there because I don't think, I mean, I've been in this game a long time, so I'm 44. And I've been talking about accessibility, inclusivity, employment, disability for a very, very long time. And one of the hats I'd love to take off is being an advocate. I didn't sign up to be an advocate and I certainly didn't sign up to be an activist. I'm very honoured to be in this position, but I can't wait to retire. Because I'm a little bit tired of talking about it now and I don't think we're getting the message through if we only speak if Brendan only speaks about vision impaired people or blind people, and if I only speak about people that use wheelchairs. Because the thing is that we call it, for a long time we call it universal design, you probably hear someone here say it today, we have an ageing population. We have mothers with prams. We have people with all of these new autoimmune chronic diseases popping up everywhere. I just tried to get my six-year-old child into a developing paediatrician um, and there's a two year wait because of NDIS and people wanting to get assessments or needing to get assessments. So right now we're living in this society where everybody really and truly has some kind of limitation, whether it's mobility, vision, um, the ability, inability to read. We've got, again, the ageing population. So when you talk about the buses, for example, and you've got kids on buses, you've got the ageing population, people, older people, they can't drive anymore. If you've got people from other countries, whatever it is, there's a whole lot of things with technology we can do now with just apps. And it's really, like back in the day, you had to get a communication device, right? For example, for somebody that needed to be able to communicate with you, they communicated differently. Somebody with cerebral palsy or... Now, we have iPads and we've got apps and we've got apps that turn on phones for lazy, able-bodied people, right? The lazier you get, the greater it is for us. Because now I can just get an app and I can go to the Harvey Norman and I can get lights that I can switch on and off on my phone. That's not a disability product, that's a you product. Through COVID, we learnt lots and lots of things about Zoom and we learnt lots of things about subtitles, right? We now know that 85% of the world, including me, watch everything, all your, what are they called, reels and all those TikTok things, and 85% of the whole world watch them with subtitles, including me, and I can hear because I just don't like the noise of it. And I don't want my kids knowing that I'm on the iPad at night. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of things that we can do if we don't just say the word disabilities. I don't think it's gonna work, even though it should, even though we are 20% of the population, I don't feel like it's infiltrating. So when we say universal design, for example, and we put a ramp in, or we put a lift in, or we put a, whatever it is, I think the whole community will use it. Like when you go to New Farm now, how many able bodied people are getting in those lifts that go up the side of those cliffs? You've got no idea how hard it was for us to get those lifts in. But we got them in. I can't get in them now because everyone's using them. Great. Because that, that, remember that really steep hill at Howard Smith? Well, yep, remember that? Well, how good is the lift now? Everyone's using it. So I think we've got to be really careful just focusing on disability today and being compliant. And please, 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 architects, builders, and my brother's a developer, anyone that's doing any kind of building, do not just follow the code. If you do that, you're going to waste your money and you're going to stuff it up. If you're going to do it, do it properly. Get someone in, either like somebody with lived experience, whether it is somebody, I always say, if you get somebody with lived experience, great, but that will not just, that won't cover all disabilities, but don't overcomplicate it. If you're going to get an architect in, get an architect with a disability. Get an OT in with a disability. I mean, you should really come back out of retirement. There's so much money right <laughs> yeah, now in OTs. We were about the OTs before. are the gatekeepers of bloody the NDIS right now. Nothing against OTs, but there is other ways to do it. So don't go out there and do a course if you don't have to. But please, please, please don't just do the codes and do not just listen to able-bodied architects and designers and builders. Please, please, please try and find some people like us around. We're everywhere. So, Carney, I think you t um, touched on a lot of, lot of different topics in your answer, but one of them is related to another question that I'm going to put to Willie, because I know we live in the same community in West End, 
And someone has asked, although it's just, oh yeah, are there some good examples of accessible buildings in Brisbane? What are the panel's favourite venues to visit? Willie, what's your answer? And a good example of an accessible building or non-accessible building, um, for an example, um, there was a building over in the city called One William Street. It's the tall building that's overlooking the Brisbane River to South Brisbane, um, to South, South Bank, sorry. Um, I was there, I was going in there for, I was meeting up with somebody for a meeting a minister, for instance, for a meeting. And I asked the minister, during the course of our conversation and meeting, I asked the meeting minister if I can be excused, I needed to go to the bathroom. Of course, there wasn't any bathroom on the level that, the, that I could access where the minister's office was. So I had to come downstairs to the, to the, to, to the street level. Okay, uh, when I came down in the lift to the to go to the bathroom, much to my horror, as soon as I opened the door, I couldn't get into the wheelchair accessible toilet because there was a bar, there was a, there was, um, Mops and buckets? No, there was a sink, a wash sink, directly in front of you as you enter the toilet through the doorway. For a person in a wheelchair, I had to carefully navigate, not be careful not to not go into the wash basin. So I had to go like this and then do a sharp left corner, left hand, into, into, a, into a building that was newly renovated and it had most of, the, most of the state minister's offices there. And I said to myself, what? And, um, and fortunately, and for my luck, the architects of the building was in the, were in the building, hanging out in the lobby. And, um, and I approached them and they said, um, excuse me, are you the, um, the designers of this building and stuff like that? And they said, yeah, we designed the building. How can we help you? And I said, oh, I have a problem. And, um, and I took them over to where the wheelchair accessible bathroom was and I showed them um, my, my problem. That it didn't even occur to them. You know, that, um, you know, this design, they had to completely, um, I showed them how I, was, how I was not able to get in, into the toilet properly and, um, and I had to be very careful because I couldn't spin around, turn around because I had to back out. And still I, stuck in there. And, so, and Willie, you've given an example of a bad building, which unfortunately, like Harney said, and there's so many. What about a good one? Okay. Can you, lock? Can you stop locking disabled toilets? The good toilets, the, I... The keys uh, are always up steps. We can't get up the steps. <laughs> the good, and stop using them <coughs> for storage. The good, bar, the, good, the good buildings I could tell you is the Brisbane City Council. Um, they're really good. Um, I could go in there, um, go to the auditorium, go to the, um, go to the cafe, go to the bathroom, and it's all laid out. I remember the, when the Brisbane City Council building was up steps. Hmm. Um, and then over time, that was all, that disappeared. And, um, and you could go right into the building. Um, access for all. That's a good one, Willie. Mm. Lorraine, I know we've talked a bit about that you um, used to be an OT, so interested in your comments on this other question that's popped up. Um, how do you push for equitable design rather than compliant design, knowing that I OTs have to work a lot in the compliance space? What's your thoughts on that one? Okay. Um, my feelings about I, I think compliant design is, is brilliant. My experience of it is brilliant, so long as it is compliant with the standards. Um, I've, I notice myself that often when, there's, when I experience a problem, it's because maybe, you know, that um, 
for example, the, the door hinges, the spring mechanisms on the door hinges might be too heavy. Um, but in fact, they're actually not compliant with what the um, standards are, which, um, which actually do define it. So, or if, you know, I, I'm fairly certain that it wouldn't be compliant to have a sink in a, um, in a, in an accessible bathroom. So, compliant design, great, but accessible design, I'm really interested in um, that. I notice that wherever I go, say if I go to a restaurant or a cafe, um, it'll have you know, a beautiful range of tables and chairs. Well, not a range, a beautiful um, set of tables and chairs that all match each other and look very nice. They might have some at bar height, but then you will, I've so often seen people who can't get in or can't use those particular tables at that height or those particular chairs or those particular table legs or pedestals or whatever. And so I'm interested in um, when you think about design of a space like that, instead of um, maybe presenting us with a, 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 you know, a, a big set of chairs that look beautiful because they look beautiful and they're all the same and there's beauty in that, that they're all the same. Could you make a range of different sizes and shapes and legs Maybe that fit in with that same design, but instead of us seeing millions and hundreds of chairs or tens or twenty of chairs and tables that are all the same, could we see them at different heights with different ped with different mounting systems, and particularly with chairs? I as well with chairs, I see you know if you look into an empty stadium and you see you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chairs that are all the same, just even in the general population. We're not all the same, you know, and it's, it's not the case that a small person can sit in a chair that's designed for a larger person with comfort. That is just not the case. We actually, I would love to see, I would love to look up into an empty stadium and see texture in, in, the, in the sizes and style of the, uh, perhaps the sizes and setup of the chairs so that you know, there were some that were suitable for people of varying statures and varying capabilities. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Catherine, did you have something to add? Yeah, can I just add on to that with what you've just said, Laurie? Um, with the designs and everything, you could make it that, uh, that it is actually height adjustable. So you could do it both manually or also electronically so that when we actually come to the buildings as such, you could make it in a way that we, you could explain to us this is actually a table or a chair that you can height adjust to what you need. It's got the safety aspect to it. And that would make it more um, inclusive and friendly as well, having that option there because then you wouldn't have to worry about um, having one section of the smaller size or the higher tables. You could do it that we adjust it to what the requirement is. Yeah, and I think, again, this is another really good example of something really tangible, isn't it? So something that you can kind of think, oh, that's a good idea and run with it. And I don't know about the rest of you, but when I go out to my favourite cafes or bars, there's often a lot of eclectic design in terms of, you know, my favourite local place gets all their plates from the, you know, from the um, vinnies down the road, so the plates are all different. So I think what Lorraine was saying as well, in, in, uh, in addition to adjustable, about just having a variety. I mean, I think it looks good anyway, so it's good design for everybody. You know, you can set up different areas that suit different needs. And I think then it just makes it easy for people to kind of feel welcome when they arrive because they think, oh, well, that's going to suit my needs, I'll go there. So, yeah, really good example, I reckon. Now, there's a question here about issues or challenges with, with accessing online services. How can this be improved? Brendan, I know this is your area of expertise, so do you want to speak to this one? Sure. Um, so... Um Lots of um, blind people uh, have troubles with online websites due to the way that they've been designed. So um, designing uh, information uh, to be accessible on websites or through um, uh, different uh, online uh, forms um, in uh, particular ways um, that they have to be designed 
in. For instance, um, images have to have alt text on them. Um, headings have to be done with the appropriate styles and, and formatting. Uh, and um, making sure that the form that you are uh, designing has keyboard input. The amount of times that I have visited a web page where um, I can get into the field, but I cannot type anything into the field because the uh, developer of the form has not made it uh, keyboard entry or keyboard um, element. So again, um, follow the standards to a point, but it is always good to get a human intelligence um, look at it and not uh, to rely upon a lot of these um, artificial design tools or toolbars that say that your um, web page or a website can be fixed in one click or in, or in um, 15 seconds, which is a lot of the marketing uh, that I see um, sort of floating around uh, the place because often those tools will actually leave you in a lot worse of a space and lead you to spending a whole heap more money than what you could have done if you had uh, actually uh, consulted a uh, person uh, in my, uh, with my disability. Brendan and the Disability Services Centrelink, are they doing well with their forms for blind people? Um, well, um, it's interesting... You are a customer, aren't you? Uh, I am a customer. Oh, right. Right. Uh, um, interestingly, um, we've had the NDIS established for almost um, 12 years now, uh, and the agency continues to struggle um, significantly in this space. The last time I requested uh, my plan to be provided in a format that I could use, it took them over six weeks uh, to get it to me uh, in a way that, um, uh, that I could read it. Uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, they still do not have um, a lot of the, uh, shall we say, the will, uh, the internal will in order to, uh, to make it happen. We have a lot of uh, people who are within the agency who are really trying uh, really hard, and I often get consulted upon um, to test for multiple uh, different issues, uh, but often when it gets thrown up the line, it's often um, rejected based on another reason. So it might be um, a separate, uh, if we implement this, it's going to cause a security breach. Or if we do this, then that puts another disability at a uh, at a disadvantage. So, um, uh, and uh, Centrelink, well, uh, Centrelink... Um, <laughs> Centrelink tries, but um, unfortunately, uh, um, the overall, uh, the overall functional issue uh, with Centrelink is they use PDF forms, and PDF forms are probably one of the biggest issues that affect um, people who are blind or have low vision because they actually have, um, in, um, they actually cause a lot of issues the way that they are designed. So if you password protect a form, or if you make content um, 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 protected, then the software um, that I use cannot interpret it. And unfortunately, uh, Centrelink makes a lot of this content um, quite accessible. So um, we have a long way to go. Uh, it forms in general, though, for, like, I'm a Gen Xer. I can't handle a PDF form. And Anybody with literacy problems can't. We've, we've, we know this. We should outlaw PDF. Let's start a movement. HTML. To outlaw. A HTML is the best way to go. If you're one. It's so hard for people that have any kind of computer literacy. It's very hard for the aging population. I find it very difficult. Anybody with trauma who t he has to go through Centrelink finds it difficult. Everything should be done easy English because the whole world right now has just gone through trauma with COVID and most of us had to access Centrelink. 
I'm guessing. So you should all now be very aware. I'm a social worker that had to access it for all my clients. <laughs> it really needs to be written in easy English because most people that are accessing it are currently in a trauma state. And PDF is not something that's easily accessible to the average person. All right, so uh, we're starting a new hashtag. No a more new, PDFs. A new movement. Ban PDFs. Ban, yeah. I don't know what Adobe's no, going to... I don't, I don't know, know what Adobe's going to think about that idea, but... Oh. Well, they can litigate. I just got a trigger. Are <laughs> you yeah. saying Adobe? But, <laughs> but I think, Brendan, sorry to cut you off, I've been given the wave that we're running out of time for this segment, and I think that what you mentioned when you gave an answer to that was really important for people in the audience who maybe um, don't have a disability or don't know someone really well who has a disability, about the, and Carney mentioned it as well, about um, activist and advocacy fatigue. I think that, you know, Brendan's saying that really when you try and access NDIS services and there's barriers to Brendan being able to access a service that is specifically for people with disability, <laughs> it goes to show how difficult day to day it is for us to constantly be up against barriers to accessing the community and getting what we need out of it. So I don't, I think Lorraine and I were talking before, I find that actually the irony is that it's in the disability space where the service provision is often the worst. But I think that that's a good segue into probably what's the last question for this one. Oh no, it's disappeared, can I still ask it? There was a question on the screen saying, what can I do as a non-disabled person to be an advocate? And for me, that's the best question of the day because the more that we can get, it was, I think it was anonymous. Let's oh, get a prize. Up the front, claps to you. I've got a Frodo Frog, but, do you like Frodo Frogs? <laughs> claps to you. Can I answer But I think it? that, yeah, you can. But I think oh. that that's such a good question because leading on from what we were saying then, you know, like Carney said, we all feel privileged to be up here today and be able to talk to you about these issues, but we all have other jobs, we all have other skills, and most of the time we end up doing this because we get so frustrated that we think, okay, well, I can't keep complaining unless I'm part of the solution. So the fact that other people saying, what can we do to be advocates, is my favourite part of the day. So, Carney, what's your answer to what, they, what people can do? Well, so, I... Uh, I guess I'm on a hunt for our army of hope givers and head nodders. What do I mean by that? So nodding your head for me to get a job is pretty much all you need to do, if, I, if I've got the credentials. So you don't need to ask me about how I go to the toilet, where's the toilet, what's the accessible toilet, all the personal questions and lifts, etc. until you employ me. Because I'm not going to come to you and get a, try and get a job that's like, for example, I don't know, a flight attendant. That would be fairly silly of me to want to be a flight attendant, considering I can't even get on a plane as a passenger and I'm a platinum frequent flyer. So, nodding your head is your first thing. So if I come to a cafe and you're like, oh, what are we gonna do? Nod your head, figure it out. Because that happens all, all everywhere overseas. You go to Fiji, you go to Bali where it's completely inaccessible, they go bulla, 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 welcome. What can we do? And they'll carry me and they'll figure it out, they'll chuck the wheelchair in the back of their whatever, whatever. America legislated it, so it became illegal, which is, I would love that to happen here. I would love it to become illegal for anyone to build anything that's inaccessible and for you to refuse entry to me. I think we're at that stage. But as an able-bodied person, when I'm not in the room and people are talking about anything, please bring us up. Because you know what I do? I march at Mardi Gras. Well, not march, well, you know, I wheel. I wheel at Mardi Gras. I'm not gay. I always speak about my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters when they're not in the room, or even if they are in the room because I'm sitting next to Uncle Willie, because I have such passion. And I lived in Rockhampton and was protected fiercely by them my whole life. So when I'm getting kicked off the plane, Qantas and Jetstar, which I've been kicked off 10 flights in the last three years. Kurt Felling has been kicked off more, so he's a manual wheelchair user. I want you to get up and get off the plane with me. When I'm getting kicked off the dream world toddler, baby dragon ride in the Shrek area, very, very dangerous. Woo! <laughs> wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But my four-year-old knows, because he was allowed to stay on there. I was kicked off. So every other mother that was on there stayed on there. And I can pretty much bet my $35,000 wheelchair that I could have got off that ride quicker than anybody else and I was the fittest person on that ride. And it shouldn't be a competition, but guess what? It is. When you're kicking me off 
because you're saying I am the riskiest person on that ride and my four-year-old can stay on there. I want you to get off the ride. I want you to write a letter. I want you to do what we don't have time to do or the energy to do, because you know what? NDIS to me right now, I'm in the fight of my life. And I'm the NDIS ambassador, I opened the NDIA, and I'm fighting, fighting. And I've been on fight mode for 44 years. I'm fighting for him, I'm fighting for her, I'm fighting for everyone, I'm fighting for myself. I need you to fight for us and with us. And they will never listen to me. Alan Joyce, Alan, 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 oh, he's gone, yay! I ran a session in the Royal Commission with Dr. Dinesh about airlines in, in Royal Commission to abuse, neglect and exploitation to people with disabilities. We took the airlines, we knew it was a risk, we thought this is gonna be a risk. The most amount of submissions the Royal Commission were about the airlines in this country because that is how much we are abused by them and neglected. I wouldn't even tell you the stories because you'd be disgusted. I need you to write a letter to Qantas and say, I just heard Carney, actually oh, don't use my name. I oh, don't no, use my <laughs> name. <laughs> because we're too tired. I gotta go home and I gotta be a mum, I gotta write to the NDIS, I gotta pay my carers, I gotta try and get a job, I gotta try and get into this building, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I can't go to Dream World, I can't go to Sea World. I'm coming to you for a job. If I'm coming to you for a job after I've been kicked off the old baby dragon ride, do you think you're gonna meet me on my best day? You're gonna meet me in fight mode. So you need to figure out a way to get me down. Because mate, I'm on fight mode all the time. And if you can figure out a way to get me out of fight mode, especially if you're in my industry, if you're in the disability industry, this should be your number one priority, is to figure out a way to get us out of fight mode, because we're in fight mode. Well, don't right, fight so. me for interrupting, because I just know one we're more running thing. out of time. One more thing, okay. one more thing before I go, is that <laughs> honestly, I beg you all to tell as many people as you can about the things that you hear today. Because right now I feel like the corporations and organisations and the public are ready to put us in the diversity box. We haven't been there before, even though we're actually sitting in every single box. And they want to do something and all they've got to do is nod their heads at us and figure it out later. Catherine, I know you wanted to add something as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say that if you're wanting to come out and help advocate and everything in whatever way you can, um, the biggest thing is, is that you're, you could be afraid and you're, you're too scared to speak up about it. Just let that go. If you see something wrong or you see something out of place, don't be afraid to talk about it. If you know someone with a disability or you just want to help, do not be afraid. I started off as an advocate, like I said, back in 2016, and it, it was crazy. I had no confidence. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And uh, I just started speaking up about it. And then to get you behind it and everything, and let, let that feeling of fear just, just go. Because that is the one thing you're going to have when you see something wrong, and you're just, you see the person that either owns the building or the, or the government or something, and you're like, I don't know what to say to this. I'm about to be. They're going to ignore what I say. Don't. Just go up, talk to them, explain the issue at hand, and then, then also think about it in the back of your mind. If this is an issue, how can we look at it in a way that's going to improve? So what can we take here that we can go to them and be like, hey, I can't access this, or I know someone that can't access this building, or get out into the community and that, and that's the thing is, we are in the shadows, and we are only now just coming out. So we need people behind us to be able to make these changes, and that is all of you here today. Mm. You can make a difference. You just have to speak up, and you've got this. So I think the summary is it's really easy to be an advocate, right? It for is. For us, because you can just pick one of us, pretend we're your friend, and just say, oh, my friend couldn't. So that's what my friends do. They go to a restaurant and go, oh, you know, my friend couldn't come here. She eats out all the time, and she drinks a lot, so she's a good customer. <laughs> and she wouldn't be able to get in here because there's too many this, or there's not a bathroom, or there's not a whatever. So just pick one of us, pretend that we've known you for a long time and just say, oh, my friend wouldn't. And you don't have to be brave like Catherine has been to stand up and talk in front of a lot of people. But it's just calling stuff out. If you see something happen, like Carney said, but even if you don't, if you just notice that something's not accessible and you bring it to people's attention, like Carney said, unfortunately, at the moment, we're still in a phase where the general public are more likely to listen to you as an able-bodied person than they are to Powerful listen to right us. Now. So... 
We'll keep yelling and <coughs> losing our voice, but you, you can join in and do it for us too. So I think that was su such a good question, so thank you so much to you for answering. Um, asking, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, Uncle Willie. Uh, with that, with that, um, when I have support workers and I'm training or um, support workers um, when I'm out and about, um, my support workers um, aren't always conversed in the area of accessibility or knowledge of disability. I am the teacher um, and um, they're my pupils. But, um, but we work together. We don't work against each other. Um, um, when I'm out, uh, my, um, I always, there's always that a thing where they'll speak to my support worker. Um, my support worker immediately says, um, I'm not here to buy. My, my uh, Willie, who I support, is here to buy something from your shop. Ask him the questions. Don't ask me the questions. Um, and it's a learning, it's a learning experience for the um, for the support worker or the um, or um, simply um, helping me across the across the road. You know where the footpaths aren't aren't level. Um, anyone can be an advocate, uh, an um, an instant advocate. Um, you don't you don't have to have a learned um, knowledge of disability. You know, anyone in the community. You'd be surprised. The old saying is power in the pen. Yeah. If you write to government, I no longer work in government, um, so I'm telling you this, write to government, write to ministers, get a wheelchair, get a pram, wheel around here, look at all the lips everywhere, write. Email them. Because it's a problem. I can barely wheel around Brisbane right now. It's a massive issue. All right. Great conversation about a very good question. So as you'll see on the screen now, we're now moving to the second part of the forum, which is where we're hoping that you'll use Slido again to put up what your big idea is to um, make the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games the most accessible yet. And as I can see from the people who've already posted a big idea, we're not really talking here just about accessibility for the stadium or attending an event at the Olympics and Paralympics. It's about thinking about ideas of the whole system. So what does it mean to come to Brisbane or to live in Brisbane and want to participate, not as an athlete, because I think Carney's the only one here who's done that, I couldn't do that, um, but participate in being a um, visitor to the Olympics and the Paralympics. So put up your big ideas and then we'll choose some and the panel will discuss those ideas and perhaps give some more interesting thoughts as to how those ideas could come into reality. So I can see already that Liz has said public transport needs to be considered. Does anyone have any thoughts on the new metro system and how this will integrate? I don't know a lot about the metro system. Does anyone, Brendan, you do? I do. Take I, it away. I know a little bit about the metro, <laughs> the new metro system. Uh, the metro system uh, is generally um, a good concept. One of the challenging things around uh, the new metro that's coming on board is all of the uh, metros are going um, electric. Now, part of the problem with this is they are silent vehicles. So uh, one of the big challenges that um, particularly people who have a, uh, a vision uh, impairment uh, is that we're not going to actually know where the uh, vehicle is and, and when it has pulled up. So um, while the metro is a good thing, we still do not have an effective way. It's been legislated in the United States and, and other countries, but in Australia, Australia uh, was asked a number of years ago to be involved in the um, for them to have a standard where vehicles um, could make a, uh, a sound, but uh, that was uh, currently uh, knocked uh, back. Oh, really? So they're not going to make them make a noise? Uh, they are currently reconsidering it, but at the uh, present moment, there does not uh, appear to be uh, the will to, for it uh, to happen. 
worry about kids mm. as well. Kids, hearing impaired, ageing population. I've got a hybrid car and it's practically silent. I keep leaving it on, which is not good either. But I keep leaving it on and, yeah, I worry about my six-year-old. He was sitting in the middle of a ramp the other day in the car park and I thought he wouldn't even hear an electric car. Mm. Ooh. We've, had, we've had a number of the... Uh, people who um, who are blind who have the guide dogs have been a number of um, situations where the guide dogs have pulled um, us back and will refuse us to um, to cross the road and then uh, we get told by some passerby oh there was an electric car there so and then we and then we become very nice to our dogs that we may have yelled <laughs> at them so we actually we. Yeah, they they absolutely get the big they, they get the big bone and <laughs> and the big treats after that one. But um, Metro is good, but there is a systemic problem with Metro. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what um, w when the um, when we approach when the games are fast approaching here. Um, it's not only about um, the physical access, you know, in and around the buildings. It's about um, accessing. Um, Things like tickets. Um, if you're going to if you're going to a, um, a concert or a basketball game or a soccer match or a rugby league game or an AFL game, a person like myself had to plan well in advance to attend something like only for 50 minutes, and you're planning for what a week in advance just to attend a simple event. Um, and um, so, you know, and you can't, and you're waiting to get to get the to get the um, sp um, the tick the get the wheelchair accessible seating online. You're waiting for what half an hour or so. Well, um, you can't get it online, right? You always have to ring a special number. A special, special number, number for number, special seating for special call. people. Person, yeah. I can give you her number. <laughs> no. Really, don't worry, man. I've got, so I've got someone for and, you. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's all about. Um, it's all about the uh, technology Sorry, on, uh, on how you, on how it, on how it, it is it going to be user friendly. Um, things like, for instance, if Brendan um, can't access um, certain certain things online, how is he going to access um, tickets for the for the for the game for the for this game? And um, and it's about not only about that. It's about how far from A to B. For example, when you get off, when you go to the airport in Sydney, the cab or the vehicles are allowed to park right out the front of the airport of the of the airport terminal. Here in Brisbane, they don't park out the front. You have to walk 50 metres with your bag and everything, or you're struggling. You know, that's what you've got to consider. Not only the physics, you got to and um, yeah, you just got to take all that into account just to attend a simple event, you know, so, that able-bodied people take for granted. I think that you've hit, whoever asked this question, I can't remember now, has hit on an important issue. We all love to talk about transport. Mm. I know Catherine. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> sorry, you were going to say something too? Yeah, that's right. Lorraine. Um, Lorraine, sorry. As well. no, I was just wanting to add to Willie. Um, you're talking about, you know, walking distances, but also to the... Um, Accessing the food outlets easily. Yeah. So annoying. <laughs> yes. Can I also add something in terms of the, the um, tickets uh, um, issue? And I think this is a very good example. So one of the largest ticketing uh, providers has an accessible ticketing form. On their on their page. So if um, like me, I'm trying to get tickets to see the upcoming Tina Arena show that's coming up. Now I've spent four hours on the phone waiting so far uh, on the telephone. So you go to the online ticketing form and you fill it all the way through, and you go through all the process, and it says this is the ticketing form for the accessibility area. So you go through, you fill it all out, then you get to the button that says submit form. And that button is not accessible. 
You cannot click it with a keyboard because the developer went through, made the entire form accessible, but forgot to put the keyboard-driven element on the submit button. So How therefore, I have gone through, I've spent an <coughs> hour of my time filling it all, in, all out, and typing it all out, making sure it's all correct, putting all the information in, but I can't submit it. Can I just add on to the Metro? Yeah, sorry, going back to the Metro. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, just going back to the Metro for a moment and like the access and things like that. Uh, one very important fact is as well is, and I'm talking from a wheelchair perspective for a moment here, is when you're in a wheelchair or have equipment in that, think about this for a second. You're getting onto the bus, you're getting onto the transport of some sort, and you're just sitting in your chair with the brakes on. We are zipping around everywhere in that bus. Our chairs are tipping over. We're going backwards. It would be good if there was an anchoring point or something that could hold the chairs down or um, even have assistance getting onto the buses and that if you have visual impairment or um, of some sort, to be able to assist us to get on. Because at the moment, it's literally just you flip the seats up, you're in, you're holding on for your dear life. And what do you do? So having like an anchoring point or something where, or even a pull down armrest or something when you're designing these um, sort of transports would make it so much safer, the, the journey more relaxing as well. And not having to just go, oh God, I've got to hold onto my chair, I'm flipping sideways, I'm flipping backwards, and just, yeah, it's a, ma it's a massive thing that people don't realise. And I think too, everyone's worrying about stadiums right now. We've got to more worry about the fact that we can't get there. Exactly. The hardest part about my day usually is trying to get to places. I've yeah. got a car, that's okay. If, that's, if the hoist is working and, and I'm working and <laughs> the kid's in the car, everything's fine. But if I had to catch a bus or a train or a maxi taxi, even though we pay them $25 to press the button, to press the lift up and then put us in, and most of them don't even tie my wheelchair down, I just transfer onto a seat because I would never in a million years try. I'm lucky enough that I can transfer because yeah. um, it's just so dangerous to be in a maxi taxi in that environment. And how we're treated once we're in there, we've got no windows, we're locked in. As females, we are females with disabilities are really way more likely to experience sexual violence of any description. We're 90% more likely. Um, and to be in those maxi taxes over the years for the past 25 years, I've never felt safe. And the amount of questions that I've been, been asked, the personal questions, being stuck there, feeling sick, being stuck in those maxi taxis, even if they show up, if they show up, we're often always late. So the, the issue is right now is there's not enough services and transport. And even if I wanted to wheel from my place at Kangaroo Point to Woolloongabba, I couldn't because of the pathways. Yeah. And that's the same for elderly people. My, like, I, I keep saying the same thing, but everyone's worried about stadiums. I am not worried about stadiums. I mean, it'd be great to get it right. It'd be silly to build a new stadium and get it wrong. Let's hope we're not that silly, but I mean, look, look what happened with Queensland Rail. I mean, that was a bit of a fiasco, wasn't it? We could get on the toilet, we'd, we'd be on the train, we just couldn't go to the toilet. <laughs> Sounds like every restaurant in Brisbane. But um, that's what I'm worried about. I'm more worried and I really, really think this is the best time ever for us to push hard because yeah. everyone's worried about 2032 Olympics mm. and Paralympics. It's really funny because I think, I think that the government think, and this is great, let them think this, and the community think this, that there's going to be like millions of disabled people in Brisbane for the Paralympics. <laughs> let, let them think that. <laughs> there'll be 5,000 athletes and there'll be quite a few of us that may want to go see it, but let them think that right now because now's our chance to get it right. So start looking around Brisbane and think, how would I get to Suncorp Stadium? Where's the parking? The most important thing for me, and everyone here is different, is parking, wheelchair parking. I can go to the toilet any which way if I have to. I can hold for 10 hours if I have to, because I've had to, because I'm a disabled person that goes out and there's no disabled toilets anywhere. So I've had to learn, my bladder is trained. Uh, but I had to leave a job at 1 William Street just recently. I was inclusive state manager. My job was to employ people with a disability in Queensland. I could not get a wheelchair car park. I don't say that to slam the government. I don't want that to be in the front page of the paper tomorrow, but that's the truth. Now, I got it when I rung the DG. I got it when I rung the Premier. 
but I didn't want to do that because if I can't get one, then I'm not going to employ my mate who hasn't got the same power as me because I was doing that when I was 22. I was r driving around Brisbane, paying for parking in Winter Garden, paying more for parking than my salary, getting the public to push me up the hill, getting the public to open the door and not telling anyone. Going down to the food court, getting the, the key from the kebab shop, going to the toilet. I did that when I was 22, 25, 27, 35. I'm not doing it at 44. Because I do not want any of my brothers and sisters with disabilities to be parking like that and living like that and not feeling like they had the power to say, I'm struggling. Because we're grateful to get work. We're grateful for, for employment. So as if we're gonna say anything else, as if we're gonna say, oh, by the way, I'm a single mum. By the way, I've got a mental illness. By the way, I'm Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So you can only imagine that when you finally do employ us, we're not gonna say anything else unless you give us that permission. So I think we've very much heard that transport is a key issue to having a successful um, Olympics and Paralympic Games. And one of the things that we really need to advocate for a lot of change, because it sounds like from what we've been saying, for different reasons, none of the modes of transport that we access at the moment really work, whether that's independent driving like Carney does, I can't drive so I rely on public transport. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. So I think that it's a really good time, like Carney said, to really advocate for the most changes we can to the public transport system and to wheelchair cabs, which is a whole nother issue. Drive, but drive <coughs> wheelchair vehicles. We need people to drive their wheelchair vehicles and do Ubers. We need the people starting their own businesses, micro businesses, think, think, think. We've got money in our packages for it, as in our NDIS packages for it. And if we did, none of us would ever catch a maxi taxi ever again. Put that on the front cover of the Courier Mail. <laughs> So I think the question, the big <laughs> ideas that are coming up are doing a really good job of thinking, like you said, it's not just about the stadium, we're really thinking about the whole journey to accessing the games. And so we've talked a bit about footpaths, but there's a question, uh, sorry, there's an idea on here about updating Brisbane City footpaths, particularly in the tourist CBD and games areas. Unlevel surfaces made of different materials makes it very hard to get about which I know we, we all find that. Um, so I think that that's another really good idea. Are there any ways, um, Brendan, for you, that footpaths are not working that would have a solution that would make them better if we're pla making plans? Um, well, footpaths are generally um, um, quite challenging in, in the way that um, they are actually laid at the moment. Um, so footpaths are... Um, often, often we have a fragmentation of different footpath uh, materials, as uh, um, has been stated. And essentially, there is a reliance on using tactile um, ground surface indicators, which are the which are the bumps um, that you guys see uh, on the ground. Um, uh, there he is, uh, and essentially. Um, there is two types. There is the um, hazard tactiles, and that tells you when there's a change in gradiency. And then there's the warning tactiles when you're getting close to stairs or or, or an object. And one of the one of the challenges around this is um, people who are sighted will put them where they think they should go and don't actually consult with people who actually need to know where they go. There's some really good examples um, outside here, in fact. One that just goes to a balcony, um, where you look over the balcony, uh, and then there's another one that just stops, in, um, just stops and goes nowhere. So that could be one of the ways that they are improved. But another way would be for governments, or especially for council, to start to um, replace the uh, footpaths gradually across and do a, do a, a maintenance and upgrade program, mm. but actually be committed um, to doing it. Because at the moment, there's over um, $70 million of money for footpaths, and I guarantee you that it's not actually be going on or, or it's not being used for what it uh, is actually being allocated uh, for. And don't put cobblestones in where they're not 
Oh, they, yes. Like, in, in Europe, they're there, right? You've got no choice. They're already there. Don't put them in. No. Like, why would you put them in? The Colosseum put a lift in. That was great, but there's, co there's cobblestones everywhere. Like, 111 George Street has cobblestones out the front. Why? Yeah, that's <laughs> ludicrous. Lorraine, how about you? What do you think about improving footpaths? What do you find are the barriers? And what, what are some ways? I think this whole idea of the, um, renewing the, all the footpaths in general to kind of get rid of hazards, making the materials the same is a really good one, but is there anything in particular that would help for you? Yeah, I think maintenance of, even, even maintenance of existing footpaths. So you'll see a concrete block, you know, has raised, you know, so all of a sudden you come across a, a lip that's maybe three, four centimetres is a real hazard and can be easily remedied, you know, with being driven, driven uh, ground down, I should say. And then the other thing I would think about, I, or makes difficult for me is with paths, is um, the curb ramps yeah. that uh, someone put in, you know, some time ago with you know great care but they just don't meet the standards so they're too steep and yeah. dangerous i've mm. i know of people who've turned their wheelchairs over and i'm one of them mm. <laughs> going up and down those sorts of ramps yeah mm. i think that's a really good example and anyone who walks around west end a lot yes. willie i don't know if you find this but some of them are terrible but some have been redone and it makes such a difference so if you've never navigated a footpath in a wheelchair before, when you go off the path onto the road, the curbs, the, the way that they're shaped, whether it's the angle or the, how steep they are, makes a huge difference for how we navigate them. Mm. So I think as part of this renewal of footpaths, that's a really good thing, because when they are changed, you notice how easy it is. It's really smooth. You don't feel like you're going to fall out. Mm. It's, yeah, it's really yeah, helpful. A lip that yeah. big is like a step. So I yeah. could probably get up a lip that big, but if you're an electric chair, you actually can't because you can't like tip your wheelchair back. Mm -hmm. And whoever put those ramp, you know, what do they call the gutters like that? So oh, they, the ones with the hole. Oh, they're they're everywhere ramps. now. They're just like gutters, I thought yes. instead of doing gutters, I'll yeah. do these silly little, I have yeah. one out in front of my house in Hendra. Again, there's a lip in front of the gutter. We cannot do lips in wheelchairs. So you, there's, yeah, I don't know but, more yeah. I can um, say. I just wanted to go back to the uh, Brisbane 2000 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, the actual site that they're going to, the actual site where they're having the, uh, the Olympic Games is actually very, very, very cultural significant to our mob, the um, Yagra people, because the Gabba is actually um, what it, it was back then, um, a, a big, Yarning circle, uh, gathering, gathering place, um, and that's where our mob met years ago. You know, over a millennium, and um, and it's a very historical site um, and culturally a site for our mob um, because it was part of the trade routes. Um, so when they were at, when they were um, when the council first thought of the GABA, they had to carefully think about not dis disturbing the ground too much because in and around the GABA was a burial place for our mob. Um, so they had to be very, very careful and they consulted with, with the local community, our mob, um, about how they were best going to lay out the ground. They spoke to architects and builders um, to make sure that they weren't disturbing the areas surrounding the Gabba that were, that were culturally safer to our mob. And, um, but in saying that, um, um, I'm going back to the 2018 Commonwealth Games where I was actually a torchbearer but not only actually a torchbearer, but I worked in the Athletics Village. And I could tell you, the Athletics Village, they made it total access. Um, so where there were ramps, it wasn't specifically laid out for a person with a disability. It was a common, it was a common thing. So if you wanted to go into the building, the ramps were there. But they, they, it took in place that able-bodied athletes 
could, 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 could go into the building as well as you. You could walk in together. You weren't going to go around the side of the building to go, in, go into a building. So they designed entranceways into um, stadiums where I worked, where it was cultural, uh, where it was totally accessible for all. You could walk in together, not, yeah. And um, Willie, I don't know whether you read that on the screen or you just happened to say a similar thing, but that was someone's big idea, is that we design the Athletes Village to um, meet standard to ensure that it's access for everyone now in the future. So it's great that you had that experience because I think that's the key. Well, the Athletes Village will be because it's a Paralympic village as well. So they are the most accessible places in the world. <laughs> but I think Trust. that's a good example I've been of to what we'd like every place mm. to look like, yeah. right? Like we the can best... walk in together exactly. instead, of around, instead of going around the building like gutter rats. The best access going, and going inclusive is lift. when we can all do it, enter the same way. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. I love it. That's one example, you know, beautiful. the... Um, the the, um, the, the, um, the exhibition centre over at South Bank there, um, if you read the story, um, um, there, weren't gonna, there wasn't really a lift in that, in that building when, that, when, that cult, when the convention centre um, was built. Um, you only, um, but uh, a person with a disability advocate harshly and, and long for it. And, um, and in, but, um, they, they relented and they, they came up, um, we sat down at the table and we talked to the designers and the architects and we came up with, a, with, a, with an idea that, that was best for everyone. They put a ramp in. I mean, they put a lift in. Nobody just thought... just need to get rid of the carpet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we all sat down at the table, you know, and we talked about it and, you know, there wasn't anybody... Um, saying that well, we're going to do this, and then, then a person like myself in, um, comes along and says, "Ah, they put a um, they put up a bit of a barrier, or the door's not wide enough. Why didn't they consult us?" But you know, it's it's when um, you talk, um, the architects and people who are like that are the most people that you wanted you want to see. You want to be sitting down in a room like this with architects and and designers and with us up here, or us in the audience with you. So when they're, when they're looking at, at things, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, yeah, this is good, yeah. Yeah, and I think that aligns with the idea that someone's put up, Liz has said, who's talking to the architects and planners about the ideas being discussed today? Is there a specific committee set up already? So I think, well, as we've discussed, a lot of us do different types of work. We all advocate on different committees, different working groups, different roundtables. We've really got to push hard on those codes to make them correct. And also, I think I said something, someone said something about government. You know, when have we ever seen a disability minister with a disability? When have we ever seen, like, even the CEOs of disability organisations? If we're the most unemployed group in the country, why don't we see people with disabilities with those jobs? We certainly would, would hope that an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander minister would be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, and that has to be the same with us as well. But we really have to think about codes. So anyone out there that has any ideas about codes, if you want to have a look at housinghub.org.au right now, anyone, and tell me how many housing vacancies, so SCA, which is Specialist Disability Accommodation, or SIL, vacancies there are in, in Queensland right now, and a housing crisis where our mates over there in West End are living in tents. How many vacancies do you think right now are on housinghub.org.au for dis disability housing? In a homelessness crisis, people are lining up for rentals. Want to have a guess? Do you think zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 600? You need a pin drop, can't you? In Queensland. Why aren't we living in them? Does anyone know? I'll leave that with you. <laughs> Can Maybe you can let people know at the end when we go outside and... You can all start thinking but and then, again, I've got a Frodo frog. Um, I think that 
oh, the one I want to talk to keeps disappearing. The system isn't working for me. But someone said something like, people talk about the legacy of Olympics and Paralympics and that we should make our legacy making Brisbane the most accessible city in the world. I think, it's, I, I think that was approximately what it said. And again, another best question for the day or best idea. I think that's such a good idea because I think that all of the things we've talked about, if those things could actually come to fruition, if all of the big ideas that you're coming up with could actually, positive change could come in, then after 2032, we could be the most accessible city in the world, and that would be we want definitely... To win. We want to get Australia number one again, right? We came eighth in Tokyo, I thought which is it wasn't a enough. competition. Is it a competition? It's always a competition. Okay. So okay. we want to win, but what I want to win is I want Australia to be, not just Queensland, Australia needs to be in the top five countries in the Western world for employment of people with a disability by 2032. We're 22nd. We're nearly the worst country in the Western world for people living with disabilities in poverty, yet we've got a $60 billion NDIS package and a blowout. So, yes, we want to win. Australia probably will win the Paralympics, but we won't win right now, because guess what? Our Paralympians right now, in Tokyo, they've got eighth. Our Paralympians right now are a mirror to us. They're not doing well either. They can't get the housing. They haven't got jobs. They're eating two-minute noodles again. They're bumming up their uncle's steps to try and get into housing. So we need to also think about employing Paralympians, future Paralympians as well, because the only reason we won in Sydney is because I was employed by Westpac Bank in a thing called the Paralympic Employment Program back in the year 2000. These things all matter. Employment matters for us to be able to live in this crisis that we're all in a rental crisis, a housing crisis, be able to feed ourselves, as well as have that NDIS package, because that does not pay for my mortgage or these nice shoes. Another big idea that's getting a lot of likes on the app is to remove traffic off the road and increase walkable and accessible green infrastructure. Catherine, what's your views on that big idea? Whilst we all love to remove traffic on the road, Pathways. Like if we go back to that for a second. Um, you can make it people with wheelchairs or even visual impairments and that we actually have a hard time getting on grass. <laughs> and whilst we want to make everything look beautiful and amazing um, and floral and that, you could do it that you have the pathway wide enough so people can walk beside us if we're in our wheelchairs or help guide us along the way. Um, and still add a bit of greenery to the sides of the paths or when, with the traffic, just making the areas just a little bit greener. So even our places for like guide dogs and service animals will have a little tiny place to go, just maybe adding in a little bit more trees in those areas. But really, it comes down to the placement and also the footpaths, if they're wide enough and if the gradient is uh, leveled. Because if it is not, like Carney and Lorraine have stated, even the most tiniest little lip, like even this small, can make such an impact and send you flying, or stop Brendan, for example, from being able to go forward. Those people on electric scooters, how are they getting around? Exactly. I'm serious. You know those people on those things? They Never jump around? the. They jump, jump them? them. Oh. Yeah, I watch them, and I think they're going to break. Yeah. But yeah. it would be absolutely amazing if we could add more greenery. I I think that's brilliant because, is there's no places for service animals or guide dogs to go to the bathrooms anywhere, and I've been advocating with the government for ages now to get ass assistant dog toilets everywhere. And that's, that's a feat, like, going on. <laughs> so having little places to go and just livening it up would just be amazing. But How funny would it be if my dog could go to the toilet, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what'll happen. <laughs> I think, Catherine, what you said there, though, is really important that, you know, green spaces can be problematic for us in wheelchairs and probably for people using canes, I would assume, as well, in terms of the grass. But that doesn't mean we put it off the table for oh, us. Oh, no, it's definitely not. No, no, and you raised really good ways to make sure that we can interact with those green spaces because I think it's really important to think about things that we all know that being out in nature is really good for our well-being and mental health. And often people with disabilities can't get to do... I think Carney's got a lot more active kind of 
um, fun, I'll jump out of things attitude than I do. But I don't want someone lifting me and chucking me in the back of a, of a four wheel drive. That's not fun to me. As my friends know, I'm not very fun. But I really do love going along paths next to the rainforest or around a park or... So I think... There's a beautiful pathway. Oh, that's my favourite. How good is that? It's and so they've got a beach good. mat. And so you wheel all the way along. And it's just like everybody else as well. Like and guess who uses the beach mat? Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Because your feet don't get hot. Yeah. But I think that's a really good example because we all don't... We, we miss out on those things that other people take for granted as part of everyday life that keeps you happy, you know, keeps you healthy, and those kind of things, that green spaces um, idea is a really good one. And what you were saying, Catherine, is really important because we don't want to just get left behind because grass is a problem. It's like, well, how can we make sure we can interact with it? And I think those solutions are quite tangible and doable. So, Honestly, it all starts with a pathway in a sense because think about this for a second. Imagine you're in these shoes for a moment. You're trapped in your house <laughs> and you literally... Give, there is a grass pathway or a, a way that you can't actually get onto the road, say you're, you've got a shopping complex across the road. How do you get across and not get your wheels stuck or bogged in and uh, without a pathway? And then there's like a, a drop to get onto the road. There's no way for you to get across. When we're doing these pathways, we need to also extend them. We don't just cut them off in front of someone's house, just extend it. Yeah. Now, I've been given the wrap-up on the time, so I thought a good way to end might be for each of us to just say the one kind of take-home message that people can take with them, whether that's how you can be an advocate or what you could put in place if you work in design or architecture, just so that people leave, because of, of obviously there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of barriers, but the takeaway is that there are a lot of things that we can all do to improve access. So, Carney, do you want to start? And then we'll come back around and end on me. Yeah, I don't want to feel, I want you all to feel like you can do something. I hope we haven't overcomplicated it even further, especially me, um, because the smallest of acts can create the largest of impacts. So if there's just one thing you can take away from today and just focus on that, whether it's the lips in the pathways, employment, employing us, we need work to be in your businesses to help you do this. Speak to government about the fact that there's not enough people employed in the government. Disable parking, seeing people there that aren't parking there and, and obviously, you know, getting them towed. Just joking. Um, but just anything you can do that can obviously be a part of our team and, like I said, become part of our army of hope givers and head nodders because we desperately need you. And thanks for coming. Willie? Well, I don't know. Um, I would say that... Um, Listen to me. <laughs> um, listen to me. If you don't have, if if you don't get invited to a forum, if there's not enough, if you don't get a, invited to a forum, and there's not a seat at the table, bring your own. Um, and. Um, Yeah, just, um, just treat me as I would treat you, as nothing special. Um, this is one of the, this is one of yours, you know. Um, you know, I'm human, like you. I'm not special. Um, so just treat me as me. I am me. I am. Yeah. Great, thanks. Catherine? Yeah, um, basically, with what you've heard here today, Take it back with you and really think on it, but also think outside the box for a moment. Think of the different ways that you can make an impact because there is so, so much that you can do. And it's just like Willie was saying is, we are our own individual selves just as you are as well, but also don't leave us out. We, we're in the shadows and we're trying to get out. And if you see someone that doesn't have the confidence or is too afraid or is just having a hard time just t chat to us, like, come up, have a conversation. Don't you know, there's no need to bend over and get to our level or anything like that. Just talk to us like we're just, we're all this, we're all individual in our own way, but we all are together in this world. So let's work on that. Lorraine? 
So being an occupational therapist, I'm actually going to talk about two very practical things. And the one is just to reinforce what I was saying earlier about I would like to see variety in the sizes and shapes and um, setup of, of furniture that's used in public spaces. And the other thing, which is I haven't mentioned, nobody's mentioned at all, is I really, if there's any designers in the audience, we need some help with rethinking the way we eat food. So a knife and a fork is a very difficult set of tools for people to use if they don't have great bilateral hand function. And I've been wrestling with this idea for a number of years and, you know, I have keep creating all sorts of tools and ridiculous bits of things with magnets and <laughs> moulded bits of plasticine. And, and, um, but if we could throw away the concept of knife and fork and sort of think, oh, how can a person who's got maybe limited function... Um, lately I've been packing up things to move and so I'm sort of going through the tools and I'm picking up pliers and I think, oh, maybe... I, I could use something like that to pick up the lettuce that keeps sliding around the, the plate and, you know, I cut it up. But I would, I would, I think that we could, and it's a problem for a ra a people with a range of disabilities mm. and difficulties. And so, but I think we could come up with a suite of eating implements that um, would allow us to eat with confidence and grace, so that when we go out in public and we go to a restaurant, we're not sort of slurping our food everywhere and just thinking, oh, just head dive onto the plate, maybe, and get it in that way. And so, anyway, that's another idea. That's good. Thank you. We need straws. I'm a quad, I can't lift my arm. So, just so you know. I, I care about the whales and the dolphins, but people with disabilities, a lot of us do need straws, and I yeah. often forget to take my straw out, um, and those paper straws don't cut it for us. Just so there's lots of different We don't want to you know, destroy to the that. planet. Yeah. But. Brendan. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Sorry, Brendan. Um, that's the thing as well with the straws, and that what Connie's just addressed on um, really, really quickly, is why are we just throwing them away? Why can't we repurpose it and re and um, recycle them and just create new straws with it instead of just throwing away, they go into the ocean and the whales and that and the tur turtles. We actually reuse, just like we're doing with other things, why can't it not be the same? Brendan, your okay. takeaway? My takeaway is nothing about us without us. Yeah. And nobody has actually said it today, so I'm going to say it <laughs> very loud and clear. Nothing about us without us. Um, what I would say is put yourselves in another person's shoes for a minute or two. Information deficit is what I have. Think about it. When you go on social media, when you put up that image, when you think, oh, it's too, I'm too bloody busy to put up that alt text. Think about how that impacts people that do, do not have vision and have to wade through the constant amount of inaccessible imagery on your social media platforms and try and look at it and try and work out what you're trying to say. And I've got a spare wheelchair for anyone that wants to go to the Clean <laughs> Street Mall or Fortitude Valley and try and access it right now. <laughs> or just go to the chemist and hire one. So or think about... Or blindfolded. Just honestly do it and see how much of your Brisbane, your city, you can access. Brisbane Valley, I mean, if you're game. <laughs> Uh, or the Brisbane Queen Street Mall, please. But think about what you do, take a bit more time. We live in a very busy um, life, but think about what you do for two minutes and think about how you can actually make a difference for all of us because, as Carney said, we need you, we, walk, we need you walking beside us, not against us. Yeah, that's a really powerful message. I think my take home, which we haven't, it's relevant to everything that we've talked about, but we haven't said specifically, is that if you're a business or a provider of a service, provide information about your access. So for us, we need to be able to make informed decisions. We know that we can't access everywhere, but it's very hard to make informed decisions when there's no information about access. 
So when we go to book a restaurant, I always seem to go to that idea, but anyway, it's, you know, you can say whether you're vegan, you can say whether, which is great, that should be on there, but you also need to be able to nominate that you need access for a wheelchair, for example, and that business needs to tell me whether or not I can go to that restaurant, can I go there, can I sit at a table, can I go to the bathroom? Too scared well, they to don't say, understand often as well. And, but also, I always say times by three. If I ask an able-bodied person how many steps they are, and they say two, I know they're six. Mm. So be honest. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. You've got to be honest. People are very scared to say no. Then we rock up and we're like, what are you talking about? There's six steps. But it's much better to be up front. We know that access is really complex and that there's a lot of things to overcome. So the more information that you can provide us to allow us to make accurate, informed decisions, I'm, I'm not likely to hate on somewhere that, doesn't that says we're not accessible, but if they pretend they are and then I turn up and I can't get in, a little bit more cranky. So that's, that's my take home message. So thanks to everyone today for all your great ideas um, and for the really interesting questions you posed. Just a couple of things before we go. The recording of this session will be, um, it's all been recorded today and that will be available online in about two weeks. Also, we invite you to join us for afternoon tea outside, go out those doors now, is that right? Yep, um, out the doors that you came in. There's a lot of um, seats available and even though Catherine rightly said you don't need to lean down to talk to people in a wheelchair, I always find it easier to talk to people if they're in a seated position. So I encourage you to use the chairs and not do all your mingling in a standing position. Um, also, yeah, we just wanted to say thanks so much and hope that you go away with some new perspective on what access means for design and also some ideas, some tangible ideas that you can take away and implement, whether that's being an advocate or whether that's being a business owner or whether that's writing a letter. We really hope that you take these things away and don't forget about all of the things you've learned here today. So I'd just like to formally thank the panel again, Carney, Willie, Catherine, Lorraine and Brendan for all of their really interesting input today and thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you. And it'll take us like 10 minutes to get off the stage so everyone should just go out while we get down.